But now we're in the book of Acts, and we are opening, uh, opening up again with a very strange text in uh, chapter 12, beginning in the end part of verse 19. So let's read it, and then we'll, uh, we'll pray and consider its application to our life this morning. Acts chapter 12, beginning in verse 19. Then Herod went from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there a while. He had been quarreling with the people of Tyre and Sidon. They now joined together and sought an audience with him. Having secured the support of Blastus, a trusted personal servant of the king, they asked for peace because they depended on the king's country for their food supply. On the appointed day, Herod, wearing his royal robes, sat on his throne and delivered a public address to the people. They shouted, This is the voice of a god, not of a man. Immediately, because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down, and he was eaten by worms and died. But the word of God continued to increase and spread. When Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission, they returned from Jerusalem, taking with them John, also called Mark. Father, we thank you for this text this morning. And Lord, we are looking forward to the lessons that we can apply to our life from this passage of Scripture. Thank you that all of it's inspired and that there's a very specific and important reason why you included this unusual text. And so we're opening our heart to you this morning and saying, Lord, just fill us and teach us. We're looking forward to what you want to do. We are eager to not only hear, but to put into practice the lessons that we learn from this text. And Holy Spirit, I just yield myself to you. Help me to teach. Uh, fill me with your power. Give me the words that I might be a blessing and your word might be a blessing as it's spoken uh, to these men and women, these young people that you love so deeply and have adopted into your family. So Father, thank you in advance for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. amen. This text that we're looking at is, is really a, a part two of the beginning of chapter 12. Chapter 12, if you remember, was the arrest of, of uh, first James, who was killed by Herod, and then the follow-up arrest of Peter, uh, two of the three primary leaders of the disciples, Peter, James, and John. And James was killed, and when Herod uh, saw that it pleased the Jews that he was killing these Christian leaders, he arrested Peter. And you remember the rest of the story. Peter was in prison. The church earnestly prayed. And the result was is this miraculous deliverance by this angel of God. And, uh, and the, the consequence of that, of course, was that Herod was trying to figure out what happened and how in the world with all of these guards and all of these people stationed around this prison and how Peter manacled to two, prison, uh, to two uh, guards night and day could have gotten away had to come to the conclusion that the guards were all lying and that they had colluded in allowing Peter to escape and so all of the guards were then killed as well. The bottom line is that Herod was in a really, really bad mood by the time we get to verse 19, which is really bad news for the people of Tyre and Sidon. And really, the, the, the truth is, is that Herod was a dictator. Now, it's interesting because uh, the word, even the word dictator is Roman in origin. It was given uh, to those who were magistrates under the emperor's authority, who were given emergency powers. And initially, this power was only to be given for a 60-day time period so that a magistrate in a particular region like Herod could uh, basically have all-out dictatorial law over the country until things were brought back under control. However, what happened historically is that uh, once Herod and other dictators like him got a taste of this power, they didn't want to relinquish that power back again. And so it became common practice that people like Herod uh, basically could do whatever they want. They were megalomaniacs. They were egotists. They were dictators. They were ruthless and cruel men. And uh, we certainly have those in our day. Uh, we, we think about Saddam Hussein as a more current one. But, you know, you think about Mussolini. You think about Stalin. You think about Hitler. Uh, we have them across the Arab nations as well. And I, I was just reading about the Syrian dictator Hafaz Hassad. Um, after a recent election, one of his prime ministers came up to him. I'm just illustrating what a dictator is like. The prime minister came up and said, congratulations, Mr. President. You won the election by a landslide. It was 98.6% in your favor. And there was less than 2% that were dissenting. He says, what could you possibly want beyond that? And Assad thought for a moment and he said, their names. <laughs> and that's the heart of a dictator. Never satisfied. 
uh, often insecure, but that's the kind of people that these dictators were. It was the kind of person that Herod was. Now, when we think of a dictator, we, we really correctly are thinking of the types of people I've mentioned, Stalin, Hitler, Mussolini, um, those types of people. But often in our own vernacular, we will kind of refer to as a, a boss, as a dictator. You know, and what we're really trying to communicate is that somebody that is kind of a tyrant, uh, somebody that has kind of an autocratic rule, somebody that just demands absolute uh, subservience and obedience, no questions asked. And so that's when we kind of think of a dictator now, we think of that. Now, I have to tell you, as I was preparing this message, I was thinking about other people that were like this, uh, other dictators uh, that, I, that came to my mind. And then suddenly the Holy Spirit began to talk to me. He says, Bob, you've got this in you too. And I began to think about it and I began to think about scripture. And then I thought, you know what? There's a dictator in all of us. There's a little dictator that lives in the heart of every man and woman here. I, I know it's shocking. I know, I know you're, you're just offended already by this message, and I hope you can listen to the rest of it. But, uh, but you're, what in the world are you talking about, a little dictator living in me? I've got the Holy Spirit of Christ. Well, I know you do. But there's a little dictator in there too, and I'll tell you why, because the Bible tells us so. How do I know? Well, first of all, let me tell you that in the fathers here, there is a temptation to be a dictator to rule with an iron fist in your home. Why do I know that? Because Ephesians 6.4 says, fathers, do not exasperate your children. Why would a father exasperate their children? By just coming over the top of them, by being so dominant, by being so demanding and so unkind and so hypocritical that the kids just go ballistic and they just hate inside. That's why God says to fathers, it's inspired by the scripture. There's a reason it's there because inside of every man who has power over his family, there is a temptation to exercise dictatorial control. There's also uh, a problem with husbands. We got two men, two men issues right in a row. Men, with your wife, there is a temptation to live as a little dictator in your home. How do I know? Because the scripture says in Colossians 3.19, Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Why would a man be harsh? Because he wants control of his home life. He wants things his way. He, he doesn't want to be questioned. He doesn't want to be challenged. He doesn't want to have someone say to him, gosh, there's sin in your life. What? You don't talk. Don't you ever. Are you following me? That's the little dictator that lives in the heart of every man that's married in this room. Not to leave the wives out. Women have a little dictator living inside of them. And I know that I'm going to get calls and letters on this, but so be it. How do I know this? Because Ephesians 5.22 says, Wives, submit to your husbands as you submit to the Lord. Now, why is it there? Because it's a temptation for a wife not to submit to her husband. She wants to dictate. She wants to control. Now, I know that you women know the biggest problem that men have is usually lust. That's the number one problem that men struggle with. And you think of that and you say, that's disgusting. What's wrong with you Neanderthal men? You know what I'm talking about. You've said it, you know, you've thought it. But women, the greatest struggle that they have is really issue of control. Now, it's not that they're trying to be dictatorial. They're just trying to survive. They're trying to make it through life in, in somewhat of a meaningful way. They're trying to sometimes work around bad decisions of their husbands and, and bad leadership of their husbands. But the result is that they're negotiating and working through. Now, how do I know this? Because in Genesis, in the opening chapters, it says after the fall that the, the woman's desire would be for her husband. And it doesn't mean sexual desire. It means authority. It means to usurp authority. It's the woman's desire to do that. And, and so there's a desire in every woman to somehow fix things at home and come over and somehow negotiate and work around and overpower in some way uh, the leadership sometimes of the husband. And so even for a wife, the Bible says to them to submit because the natural tendency of a woman is not to submit but to, to lead or to usurp authority. Now, what about a boss? Well, this is pretty obvious that when you're a boss, you have the power because you're holding the, the paychecks uh, of your employees. And so a boss has a great temptation. All of you men and women who have businesses in the community, uh, it's a great temptation to use that authority. And really, you know, it's that little dictator's inside that kind of loves being in power, kind of loves being in control and enjoys bossing people around and telling one person do this and another person do that and they do it and it's like power. You know, there's that enjoyment of that. 
And that's why, uh, why the text tells us in Ephesians 6, 9, masters, treat your sl- slaves in the same way with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart. Do not threaten them. Dictators threaten people. Why is it here? He's writing to Christians because inside of every Christian boss is this temptation to be a little dictator. Do not threaten them since you know that he who is both their master and yours in heaven and there is no favoritism with him. Now, one last area that, uh, that I unfortunately have to touch on is pastors <laughs> because the Bible addresses this issue with pastors because in the heart of every pastor is this temptation to, to be a little dictator and some of you have seen it and some of you are saying, I see it now. He's standing right in front of me at this moment, you know? Okay, well, you can talk to me afterwards. I'd be happy to talk to you. But in the heart of a pastor, because of power and leadership, is the temptation to use that authority to dictate in inappropriate ways in the lives of other people, to to, uh, require absolute subservience, no questions asked, absolute obedience. Don't question authority. And so we find in in 1 Peter chapter 5, it addresses this issue. Peter, who is writing to elders, says, be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care serving as overseers, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not greedy for money, but eager to serve. Now listen carefully. Not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. So even right here, I'm cautioned in, in this particular arena that I am not to lord it over the flock. That's completely inappropriate. But the point is, is that all of these texts in Scripture are there, not just so we can look at a guy like Herod and say, dictator, but we can also see in ourselves the potential to be little dictators. We have to be very careful. I have to be very careful. Let me share something with you briefly before we move on that has helped me and that I kind of address life in general this way is that I used to think I can't do certain things. I would never cheat on my wife. I would never commit adultery. I would never do these certain things. And then I read a a research um, uh, statistic by George Barna who did research on pastors who fell morally. And this is the only thing that thousands of pastors who had fallen had in common. Not one of them thought it could ever happen to them. And so from that point on, I made a a, a decision. I am capable of anything. I am capable of adultery. I am capable of uh, being a little dictator. You fill in the blank, I'm capable of it. Now, why is that important? Because if I address myself that way and put parameters and, and measures in place to protect myself from that, knowing I'm capable, I'm much more protected than I would be if I said, I'm not capable of that. Now, some of you this morning are thinking, I don't know what he's talking about. I can see that in my husband. He is a dictator. And I can see it in my boss, but the nerve to think that I'm a little dictator Well, all I can tell you is that the safest measure that you can take is to open your heart to this whole issue and examine and explore the possibility that maybe you have been misusing your authority. And if you really want to know, if you're really courageous, if you're sincere about discovering the truth about that, ask your spouse, ask your children, ask the people that work under you, and just ask them honestly, do you think that I misuse my authority? Now, don't do it like this, you know, while you're saying it. It's kind of a giveaway that you are a dictator. Uh, But if you really want to know, just ask. But humble yourself and say, Lord, I don't want to live this way. I don't want to empower myself with the gifts you've entrusted with me and use them inappropriately. And so the message really is, is that we all have the capacity to be dictators. And every one of us are called and commanded by Scripture to overcome that urge. Because the Bible says, Jesus speaking clearly, the greatest is the least. And if you want to be great in the kingdom of God, you must be the servant of all. Now, a servant is not a dictator, and a dictator is not a servant. You can't live both at the same time, and so a life of service is a great remedy. Another thing that is, I think, a great remedy for this whole issue of of being a dictator and the the roles of authority, and everyone has some authority in life in some arena, one of the most powerful and potent uh, remedies to this issue of being a dictator is simply a heart of thanksgiving. The Bible says that every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heaven. So that means that anything that we have, any influence, any role of authority, any role of leadership has been given by God. We must be thankful for that and then come under that leadership and serve in whatever capacity we have as under shepherds. And we need to look just like Jesus. We need to act just like Jesus in whatever role of leadership we have. And if we don't, And if we fail in that, 
then we're letting that little desire of dictatorial rule and pride creep up in our life. Now, I find it interesting that as the disciples and the early church is facing this dictatorial leader, this megalomaniac, Herod, that they made no effort to empower themselves to overcome him. They didn't threaten to unseat him. They relied solely on God's de deliverance and they prayed earnestly. This word uh, that we talked about several weeks ago, it means to stretch yourself out. It's actually a medical term, meaning that a muscle is stretched to the absolute limit of its capacity before snapping. And so this muscle, this prayer muscle that the church was exercising wasn't just like a, these little softball prayers that sometimes we throw up when we have a problem. I mean, these people were fasting and they were praying and they were crying out to God. It was their only, uh, their only uh, choice of what they made a decision to do, which was to seek God in the midst of this conflict. Now, uh, part of what I want to get at in this, in this teaching today is what do you do when you're facing a dictator? Now, I want to clarify something very briefly because there, there are different arenas of life where we face this. If you're talking about an unbeliever, if you're talking about a politician, for instance, or someone in the Middle East, or even you know, someone in, in leadership within our country, that's not an area that God says you have purview or, or a responsibility. He says, submit yourself to the authority. God will take care of raising and lowering a leader. However, when it comes to the church, it's a very different remedy. The remedy is Matthew 18. So Paul says very clearly in 1 Corinthians, it's not up to us to judge the unbelievers. In other words, it's not up to us to, to try to straighten out unbelievers in leadership, in, in life, in power uh, positions that we have no control over. However, he says, it is our responsibility to judge those inside the church. And that's why, for instance, when a pastor fails or, or commits some sort of grievous sin or whatever, there's a very clear corrective process that that pastor has to go through because in the church, we are to judge that kind of sin so that a, a pastor like myself can't be a dictator and, and, and be unaccountable. That is not the case. I am accountable. Every person in leadership in our church is accountable. We can't operate that way. And I just want to make that clear because the church was praying over, uh, uh, over Herod, who was an ungodly dictator. They had no power, but they brought it to God in prayer and they stretched themselves out in prayer in a very powerful way. Now, the, the interesting thing is that the text doesn't tell us exactly what the church prayed for. But what we know is that the prayer was powerful because Peter was released and more than they even imagined took place after that, which brings us to the second part of verse 19 with Herod Agrippa I as he went from Judea to Caesarea, which was the kind of the capital, the, the, the brain of the Roman Empire at that time. Now, Herod Agrippa, the man that we're looking at, was the grandson of Herod the Great, who was the one that killed all the young born babies two years and under when he thought his kingdom was being threatened by this coming Messiah. He was also the nephew of Herod Antipas, who had a role in the trial of Jesus Christ. So he came from, uh, from pretty wicked lineage. And, uh, and as I said, he was agitated. Now, it's bad enough being around somebody that's upset, but it's really bad when the guy has absolute supreme authority and power. And now the people of Sidon and Tyre are about to face Herod in a really, really foul mood, very angry and embarrassed that he had lost his prize, uh, this disciple of Jesus Christ named Peter. And so he came in a very quarrelsome mood, and the Bible tells us in verse 20, he'd been quarreling with the people of Tyre and Sidon. Now, they've been quarreling about food. Now, the reason we know that is because, well, first of all, Tyre, the actual name Tyre of this place, it's in Lebanon. It's north of Israel along the coast. It's a, it's a rocky, barren, it's just, there's nothing there except rock. There's no soil there. There's no agriculture going on there. And the reason is, is that in Ezekiel, the Bible tells us that because Tyre and Sidon, uh, during the invasion of Assyria against Israel, were mocking the Israelites, and we're really enjoying the defeat of Israel. And so God says, I'm going to curse you. And listen to what he says. I will scrape away her soil and make her a bare rock. Out in the sea, she will become a place to spread fishnets, for I have spoken, declares the sovereign Lord. So we go back to the Old Testament and we discover that the reason that Sidon and Tyre were so dependent on food sources is because they had zero agriculture. They had lots of, of shipping industry, but no food supply. And Herod was the one that held the purse strings. And evidently there had been a food blockade against Tyre and Sidon over this issue of, of food distribution. And so um, 
The people of Tyre and Sidon did what, what normal people do, what unbelievers do. They joined together in an alliance. They sought an audience with Herod. They secured the support of Blastus, who was a trusted servant and treasurer of Herod, and they asked for peace. So they were basically using the world's methods of negotiating with the despot, with the megalomaniac, with an egomaniac, with a dictator named Herod. And so they formed alliances and they scheduled meetings and they leveraged re relationships that were existing and they petitioned for a truce. Verse 21 tells us that, that Herod met them on the appointed day. Now, it's interesting, uh, it doesn't just mean that he scheduled an appointment with the people of Tyre and Sidon. It means that there was an event taking place that day. Now, interestingly, Josephus, who was an unbelieving historian at the time and very well known for the accuracy of his reporting and his history, uh, historical writings, actually writes about this whole event. And you're thinking, why would he do that? Well, the reason was is that Herod had this catastrophic illness that brought him to his knees and brought him to death in a very short period of time. And so we actually have an accounting of what happened and Josephus gives us the information on it. He says the day was actually a celebration uh, honoring Caesar. And so it was on this day when this gathering took place. And of course, uh, Herod, uh, being the dictator and egomaniac he was, came wanting to impress, wanting to intimidate, wanting to empower himself. And so he comes wearing his royal robes and he sat down on his throne. You know, I mean, you get the, get the picture. The guy is just pompous, you know. He just comes in there and he, the robes are behind him and he's got people bowing down and he, you know, swirls his cape around and, you know, his robe and then he, he sits down and people are hovering around him and everything. And then the Bible tells us that he gives a speech. Now, what do you do when you've got this egotistical megalomaniac dictator for a leader who holds your food supply in his power and you're completely helpless. Well, you've got to do something. You've got a strategy. You can't overpower him and so they flatter him. That's what, it, in fact, it says in, in Jude 16 that the wicked flatter others to their own advantage. And by the way, uh, it works. Flattery really works. Why? Because there's a li little dictator living in all of us as I repeated myself, am I going again? But there's a little dictator that loves to be flattered. We love to hear nice things about ourselves, and, and it ingratiates us to people as long as it's not overdone. And so it does work, but the Bible actually forbids it. In fact, in the book of Job, Job says, I will not do that because I know that God would bring me to my end for such behavior. God doesn't honor flattery. But the people, of course, in Tyre and Sidon uh, are not believers and they have no convictions about this issue no trust in God, no one to turn to, and so they flatter him. And so in an orchestrated way, they begin to cry out from the audience, this isn't the voice of a man, this is the voice of a God. You know, you just have to think to yourself just for a minute, how far down the road does a man have to get to actually hear something like that, receive it, and actually believe it's true and accept it? It gives you an idea of how far Herod had gone, but he came from a long lineage of men that had led just like he was leading. And so he received this praise. By the way, this attitude really is the source, the source of all of it is pride. It's been the downfall of many people. You think about Satan, uh, Isaiah 14 verses 12 through 15 actually recount the fall of Satan. He was the anointed cherub of God. He was the highest order of created being in God's kingdom, but it wasn't enough he wanted to be God himself and worshiped as God. And as a result, he fell. Adam and Eve in the garden, they didn't die and, and uh, be cast out. They weren't cast out of the garden for eating the fruit. They were cast out because they wanted to be like God. That was the temptation. That was the draw. That was the ticket that Satan put in front of Adam and Eve is that he knows that if you eat this, you will be like him. And that was the draw. And the result was their downfall. I think about the Antichrist in 2 Thessalonians 2.4. In the end, it says that he will set himself up in God's temple and demand to be worshipped as God. There's this thing in us. And God wants, by his spirit, to overwhelm it with the activity of a servant heart, a submitted and soft and yielded heart in these areas of leadership that we have. But we have to be so careful because there will be people that will attempt to use flattery to negotiate, flattery to gain advantage. I like what John Corson says about this. He says, flattery is like bubble gum. You can enjoy it for a moment, but don't swallow it. <laughs> so there's a real danger. We've got to be very careful about this whole issue of flattery. 
But Herod wasn't careful. And verse 23 tells us that because he didn't give praise to God, he was immediately sanctioned. And the Bible tells us in Isaiah 42, 8, that I am the Lord, that is my name, I will not share my glory with another or with an idol. And Herod had set himself up as another God by receiving this praise. And so the Bible tells us that um, not only was he sanctioned by God because of receiving praise, but the context tells us that it was also because he was an enemy of the church. Now, it doesn't say that directly, but the fact that this story is in the context of this whole scenario of, of Herod attacking the church, the church praying, we see some evidence that he's also paying a price. But it's important to note that it wasn't the primary reason because there have been dictators and, and uh, egomaniacs all through hu- human history who have slaughtered people of God uh, in, in mass, and yet they weren't killed immediately. What killed Herod immediately was not slaughtering the leaders of God's fledgling church, but his pride and his unwillingness to acknowledge God for who he was and receiving the praise that belonged only to God. And that's part of the reason why I want to encourage you that the, the safest countermeasure that God has given us besides the work of his spirit and the word of God is a heart of thanksgiving and a heart recognizing that every good gift comes from above and that whatever role of leadership you have, whether it's as a husband or a father or a mother or a business owner or a person in leadership in the church or whatever role of leadership you have, that has been entrusted to you by God for you to act on and to live out in such a way that if Jesus were there himself, that you are acting exactly as Jesus would in those same circumstances. So that no matter what the circumstance is, that people say, you know what? You make difficult decisions. You ma- you've had to go through some hard things. You've done this, you've done that. But you know what? You've been like Christ the whole way through. You've done the godly thing. Whether it's at home or in a business or with your children, raising your kids, that there is a sense of justice and integrity and honesty and transparency and godliness in everything that you do. But Herod was not such a man. And so verse 23 tells us that he died a painful death and the angel of the Lord struck him down. Probably the same angel that delivered Peter. Now it's interesting because uh, it says that he was eaten by worms and died. Now that is a really gruesome picture. I mean, I, you know, my mind, I'm just thinking, how does a guy get eaten by worms and die? That is just gotta be one of the worst ways that a person could go, being eaten from the inside out. Now, I told you about Josephus, that he recorded all this. Let me read to you the storyline that he wrote about this day and this event. Herod put on a garment made wholly of silver and of a contexture truly wonderful and came into into the theater early in the morning, at which time the silver of his garment, being illuminated by the fresh reflection of the sun's rays upon it, shone out after a surprising manner and was so resplendent as to spur over those that looked intently upon him. And presently his flatterers cried out, one from one place, another from another place, though not for his good, that he was a god. A severe pain arose quickly in his belly and began in a most violent manner. And when he'd been quite worn out by the pain in his belly for five days, he departed from this life. That's the story. In the text, it almost makes it seem like it happened immediately, but it took five days for him to agonize and go through this tragic, tragic experience. There's kind of a poetic justice in the death of Herod. He killed James and sought to kill Peter, and so God took his life. He played the politician, and politics killed him. He dressed in such a way to project splendor, uh, which was divine, and yet he died an ignoble death in the most painful way. He killed James, who from a spiritual perspective was a great leader and will be rewarded. And on the other hand, we have the death of Herod that was quite inglorious. Here's the lesson in these things, is that God is able to deliver his saints from evil men and to deliver evil men from divine judgment. You know, as I was thinking about all these issues, and I kind of shared at the beginning this whole issue of of, uh, what I can see in myself, because as I prepared this, I just really, I'm like, Lord, please don't let me have any, any kind of a heart like this. God, cleanse me of anything that would be anything except a servant heart of God. And last week, I I had a situation where I realized that I misused my my authority and my power in my family. 
after the service, uh, I, I don't know, I just was having spiritual warfare, and by the time the service was over, I just felt so pulled. I, I can't tell you why, because every week I, I'm praying with people and t- counseling and loving and encouraging and doing everything I can to build up as many people as I can, and, because I just love you guys, and I, and I know the Lord loves you. And but by the time the service was over, I just felt really stretched. And there's some things that happened after the service that, that were frustrating for me and annoying. And so, you know, I got in my car. And, uh, you know, the reason I relate to this, I'm thinking, I, I, I think I know what it's like for, for the people of Tyre and Sidon to have to face Herod. Because I was Herod last week. Um, didn't kill anybody. I thought about it, but I didn't. And, uh, and, I, and I got in the car, and, and as I was uh, uh, driving away, the Holy Spirit said, don't say a word. Don't even speak. Just drop it. Don't speak. Don't breathe. Don't, don't in the car, you know. And finally, I just kind of let it squeak out. I said, I'm not happy about, uh, uh, very happy about a couple of things. And I directed it to my boys. And really, my boys had nothing to do with the situation at all, but they were kind of involved to a certain degree, but it wasn't them, and it wasn't really even their responsibility. And I I just started getting angry inside, and it started just kind of spilling out, and I just went off on my kids in the car right as we left this parking lot, right after church. It was really sad. My poor kids just, like, they were just, like, in the back, back seats like this, you know, as I was yelling at them. My wife was like this on the side of the car. And I finally, I, I, just as we were kind of halfway down the bypass, I said, somebody tell me to stop talking. <laughs> somebody tell me to shut up, you know, to just don't say another word. And you're thinking, why in the world am I telling you this? I'm telling you for, for several reasons. One is that I'm telling you that this isn't all of us, that we have this temptation to live this kind of a life. And, and people around us end up being terrified of, of our leadership because of that kind of, uh, of a leadership style. And it's completely inappropriate. And I got convicted right away. And I, and I asked everybody's forgiveness and asked them to please pray for me in the car. And, and, um, and then I just, I, I felt like I was, they forgave me right away. And we, we reconciled and everything. And, um, but, you know, I, I, I asked forgiveness for the next three days after that because I just felt so convicted uh, because that's not what I, how I live or what I want to do. And yet, that's exactly what I did in the car. I can't make any excuses. I disobeyed the voice of the Holy Spirit. And maybe there are uh, two or three of you out there that have done the same at some point in your life uh, where, where you knew what to do and you didn't do it or you knew what not to do and you did it anyway. And so I, I, I come to this message this morning with a heart to say, I have this in me. I can look, we can look at Herod and say, what a creep. I'm so glad he got eaten by worms. But the fact is, is that that's not a very good way to come to the Bible. The way that I need to come to the Bible is, Lord, what can I learn from this? How can I grow? How can I be changed to become more of the man that you want me to be? And the thing I'm coming away with, number one, is that I, I am not to live that way. I'm not to be that kind of man. I don't care if it's with my family or with my wife or with people at church or in a, in a private meeting or in a public meeting or in, in church. It's just whatever I am and wherever I am, I'm to be what Christ is and how he lives and how he conducts himself. And so we find that in the midst of all of this, even dealing with, uh, with somebody that's inappropriate like Herod, God answered the prayer and removed him. I, I just love that, that God took care of it. And God can take care of you because we not only have to be concerned about our potential to live this way, but we also have to be concerned about those in our life that live that way. What do you do with a dictator? And we'll say with a little d. What do you do with somebody in your, what do you do with, a, with uh, someone in your life, a boss or someone in the community? How do you handle that? Or what do you do with a Christian in your life who you've tried to confront and they won't respond? What do you do when you've taken it as far as you can and done everything you can and he still or she still won't respond? Well, the Bible says that you are to entrust yourself to the Lord. We have examples of this all through Scripture. Um, I think about David and Saul. Do you remember when David uh, crept into that cave and uh, Saul was, was Uh, sleeping inside and he came and cut off the edge of his robe and he got convicted right away about it and he repented and it was about 15 chapters later in the same book that God took care of Saul and not only Saul but all of his sons and he wiped them out but it was at the hand of the Philistines do you remember David with Nabal when Nabal this this idiot this fool married to Abigail and uh, David just was like I'm gonna kill this guy and, and in a very real way, he had justification to do so. But Abigail intervened and said, don't do it because one day you're going to be the king and you don't want this on your conscience. And so David responded. He got reeled in and God struck that man dead 
in just a matter of days and he became like stone, probably had a stroke and he died. God took care of it. How about, um, uh, we've got the story of Mordecai and Haman. You remember that story where, where Mordecai, this godly Jew uh, in the book of Esther and, and, and that, how that whole thing unfolded but he had a mortal enemy named Haman and Haman was determined to take him out. And, and Mordecai, we don't find one thing about, about him petitioning the king or signing, uh, you know, some sort of a, a petition to get rid of him. He didn't leverage any relationships. He didn't do anything. He just prayed. And Haman hung on the gallows that he had been preparing for Mordecai because God delivered. How about Daniel and his accusers? Daniel and the lion's den. You remember the story? This godly, godly young man. And he's accused by the, by the other uh, the soothsayers and satraps and those uh, wise men of Babylon. And, and they accused him of worshiping uh, God and not uh, the, uh, the king of, of Babylon. And so the story goes that, that they threw him in the lion's den. And the king was distressed about it. But he prayed all night that God would deliver him. He got up in the morning and said, Daniel, servant of God, the most high God, are you there? And Daniel says, Hey, okay, everything's fine. Angels of the Lord have closed the mouths of these lions. And so they pulled him out. And what happened to Daniel's accusers? The king, not Daniel, the king got all of these accusers along with their entire family and threw them in. And it says that even before they hit the ground, they were devoured by these lions. There's quote after quote, passage after passage, historical story after historical story I could relate to you of what happens when the people of God stretch themselves out in prayer. I'm not talking about throwing up a softball prayer. You know, those, you know, uh, have you prayed about this? Well, uh, yeah, last week, I, gosh, I must have spent five minutes, you know, really crying out to God, just, you know, pretty, got, got pretty exhausted. Yeah, wore myself out for God. Are you, you, you see what I'm saying? I mean, we'll go to counselors, we'll spend money, we'll exhaust ourselves, you know, talking to people on the phone, but we won't extend ourselves in prayer. But when people do, God delivers. Every one of us has a dictator in our life, someone that misuses the power that has been given them. What will you do? How will you respond? You have a choice of using the world's methodologies or you have the choice to use God's methodology. And God says, I want you to extend yourself in prayer. Don't return evil for evil. Leave room for the wrath of God. I will repay, says the Lord. Stay out of the way unless it has to do with the church, unless it has to do with the functioning of a believer's life that's in serious sin. In that case, we're called to take action. But in all the other venues of life, the Bible says that we are to be people that extend ourselves in prayer and wait for the Lord. Now, the result of all this is that the word of God, we're told, uh, continued to increase in verse 24. Uh, Herod decreased, deceased, but the word of God increased. And uh, all over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit, as Colossians tells us. It advanced in God's way, in God's power, and in God's timing. How did it advance in God's way? Well, the Bible says, don't repay evil for evil. Leave, leave it to me. Jesus said, or Peter said of Jesus, that when they hurled their insults at him, at Jesus Christ, it says he did not retaliate. Now that's what a dictator wants to do. When somebody attacks, attack back. Jesus didn't. He refused to do so. When he suffered at the hands of dictators, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. We're told that it advanced in God's power. Ephesians 6 tells us that our struggle isn't, isn't against flesh and blood, but against rulers and powers and principalities in high places. It's a, it's a demonic warfare. And so the, the worst thing that we can do is to get into a, 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 a human struggle with another person, even if it's your spouse or with a coworker or an employer or even someone in church. The most important thing we can do is recognize that we must not fight with the, with the weapons of the world, but with spiritual weapons. And the pr premier one that we have in the kingdom of God besides the word of God is prayer. And the third thing is that it, it advanced in God's timing. Deuteronomy 32, 35 says, it's mine to avenge, I will repay. And listen carefully, in due time their foot will slip. Not in your time, not in my time, but in due time. Their day of disaster is near and their doom rushes upon them. And it certainly rushed upon Herod. 
One of the verses that I'll share with you that's helped me significantly in, in ministry and just in life in general is 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 19. It comes at the end, it begins in, in verse 12. It's all about suffering as a Christian, not suffering for being an idiot, not suffering for sinning, but suffering for simply living for Christ. And at the end of this section, in verse 19, he says, So then, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. See what it says? It says, don't be waylaid by a dictator, but entrust yourself to God and then continue to do good. And too often, I found even in my, in my experience as a pastor, I have been waylaid trying to get everything figured out and corrected. Meanwhile, so busy with correcting it that I wasn't continuing to do good. And so God has really shown me, Bob, entrust all these issues to me. Entrust everything that happens in your life and in ministry, anywhere. Entrust it to me and then just keep moving forward. Keep doing good. Keep advancing the cause of Christ. Because at the bottom all of, the, of all of these things is not Herod, and not Herod-like men or women, but at the bottom of all of it is Satan, who is the dictator of dictators. He is the one who, above all, wants to usurp authority. And behind all the orchestration of all the despots and megalomaniacs and egomaniacs and dictators in the world stands Satan, orchestrating to the best of his ability the demise of the work of God. But he will fail and fail miserably. And the Bible says that we're more than conquerors through Christ. So we find that at the end of these things, Paul and Barnabas finish their mission and pick up John Mark, who we'll talk about uh, next week in our study. But I want to just close by encouraging you with several things. Number one is that just recognizing in all humility that we have the ability, every one of us here, to misuse and mishandle the authority that God has given us. So my encouragement to you is that, I guess number one is that you would have a heart to repent and there probably isn't a person here that doesn't need to, to take care of that business before God and say, you know, I just, I haven't, in that situation, I was too rough. In this situation, I had a bad attitude. In this other situation, I, I, I really made a decision that was unjustified and unfair. And I need to back away from that. And I need to go make it right. I need to actually repent and ask for forgiveness for that misuse of the authority and power God has given me. And, and then put some, some, uh, some safeguards in place so that that's an area that at least you're aware of that you could misuse the authority and responsibility God has given you. And the second thing I want to share is, is that because we will face people like this in life, that God gives us a very clear example, not just in this situation that we're looking at in this text, but over and over and over historically through the Old Testament and through church history of the saints of God who refused to battle in flesh and blood but stretched themselves out in prayer before God and experienced miraculous, powerful deliverance in God's time. And God will do it for you as well. But he's looking for men and women who will stretch themselves out before him in prayer. But if you're willing to live that kind of a life, I think that you'll see dramatic things happen and you'll see the power of God and God will clear the way where there seems to be no way in your life. Father, we thank you for this time this morning and for your word. And God, I pray that you would take the simple presentation of these truths and use them for your glory. Father, protect us, first of all, from uh, inappropriate use of the authority that you've given us in life. God, may we never, under any circumstance, allow the position as husbands or fathers or wives or parents or employers or even pastors in churches, or leadership in a church, may we never, ever, under any circumstance, misuse that authority. But God, I pray that you would teach us to be men and women who are humble as Christ, who led as he led, by example. So much so that Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, follow me as I follow Christ. Father, I pray that there wouldn't be anything unturned in our life where we wouldn't be willing to repent, willing to be corrected, willing to change, willing to surrender, willing to yield, and to let you work in us, your character, your nature, your attitude, your heart, your words, your life. As it says in 1 John, whoever claims to, to know him must walk as Jesus did. And I pray in this area of authority, in this area of responsibility, 
God, that you would give us a heart like that, Father, and that the world would see and be transformed. And I pray, God, right now for anyone who's under the leadership of a dictator in their life. And they are at the end of themselves. They don't know where to turn. They don't know how to resolve it. They don't know what else to do. God, we want to stretch ourselves out right now in Jesus' name and their behalf and say, God, please deliver. We don't want anyone eaten by worms. But God, we do want transformation. Deliver those, God, that are suffering. Deliver those that are burdened. Deliver those, God, that are under the thumb of someone, maybe even a believer, maybe even someone here today. And I pray, God, that the outcome would be restoration and fruit and joy and transformation and power and glory and praise to your great name. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.